Hi, Michelle. Hi, John. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Awesome, awesome. I'm very excited because we are talking about one of your favorite <laughs> topics. In fact, you are very passionate about what we're going to be talking about today. And um, lots of news out there about the changes that are going to be taking place on the, uh, in terms of our retirement uh, funds. And uh, yeah, I think we're going to hone in on that. But before we get there, maybe let's start right at the beginning. What do you do at Old Mutual? Sure. What do I do at Old Mutual? So I, I work within the Old Mutual corporate business, working with retirement funds and pension funds, assisting in terms of designing, developing, and also around member education to helping people fully understand um, what they have when it comes to their pension fund. And how long have you been involved in that space? Sure. I've been involved in the financial services space for about 25 years now, oh. getting my age away. Mm, sure. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about uh, a, a retirement, you know. What is retirement? Uh, maybe let's start there. I mean, I, I think the first time I had somebody teach me about retirement, they said retirement is one of the most depressing words uh, you can find in the dictionary, you know, because it talks about isolation. And what is retirement? So I think it, 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 the definition of a time is beginning to change, but traditionally, Retirement was at that stage where if you've been working your whole career, you'll get to a point where either you don't want to work anymore or you can't work anymore um, as you reach the retirement age and uh, you want to sit back and relax after your hard work. So, so really retirement is that time where you no longer have to actually physically work for your income um, past a certain age. So in South Africa, we refer to retirement ages of 60 or 65. So traditionally, you reach that age and you stop working and then hopefully start living on your savings. But sometimes people do want to continue working, but the body wouldn't allow them. Correct, correct. And I think what people don't realize and often underestimate is probably one of the biggest assets we have. It's not our house or our car, it's our salary. Mm. Um, and if you will eventually in your life get to a stage where you either can't work, as you mentioned, your employer is going to, uh, the retirement age says you have to stop working from an employment contract perspective, um, and then you need to have something to fall back on. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, there are those two elements of either you want to or you can't. Mm. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that, I mean, people go, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to retire. But that makes sense if you're 60, 65, or 70. Mm. But realistically, I don't know many 80 and 85 year olds that are still out there working. Mm. Um, so from that aspect, we need to put some sort of savings in place. So what is a normal retirement age in South Africa and how does it compare with other countries in the world? Yeah, so I think there, South Africa is, has got a situation where there's almost two retirement dates that people refer to. Mm. So the first one is what we call the, uh, the date where you qualify for the old age state pension. So mm. government states quite clearly, if you reach 60, you then qualify for the old age state pension, and that's currently sitting at just about 1,900 rand a month. Mm. So that date is 60. From a tax perspective, SARS recognizes that once you reach the age of 55, mm. you can, you're allowed to retire and get the tax benefits of retirement. And then, overall, there's normally what an age that your employer sets as the retirement age. Mm. And that's one thing in South Africa is, is, according to our employment laws, employers can set a retirement age, and that's the age at which you leave the employer. And that age is very dependent on that employer. Mm. So it'll often depend on the industry you're in, the type of work you do, etc. So a retirement age is very from usually between 60 and 65. Mm. Now you ask the question about how does that differ to the rest of the world. Within South Africa, we've stuck very tightly between the 60, 65 number. We're seeing overseas, especially in a lot of European countries, that age is becoming older and older. So you yeah. hear ages of retirement of 67 mm. and 70. And a lot of that is because we're getting healthier, mm. we are living longer, and mm. so actually you're physically able to work for longer than we used to. So that varies, I think, around the, around the world. So does that mean that there is a possibility that somebody can outlive their money? <laughs> without a doubt. Mm. Without, without a doubt. And I think it's getting more and more uh, of a realistic situation. So if we look at, at working, right? So, so the average working person starts working at 25, for example, and finishes working, let's say, 65. Let's be optimistic. So that's 40 years of working lifetime which sounds like a really long time, especially if somebody's just starting out and you look forward and you think, I'm never going to get that old. Um, 
But once you reach 65, what's your life expectancy? You don't know what date you, your date of death, thank mm. goodness. So essentially what that means is you could stop working at 65, but work till 80. Well, I mean, live till 80 or 85. And we all know someone who's in their late 80s or early 90s. Mm. Um, and then you start doing the maths, and that's 20, 25 years of not earning an income. Mm. So the real art of saving for retirement and being okay for retirement is to optimally use that time while you're working, those 40 years of saving, so that you've got enough to live on, on for, say, those 25 years. So, you know, if you save for 40 and live on it for 20, that number starts making sense. The problem is if you're only saving for 20 years, you're not gonna, that money's not going to last you 20 years, unless, of course, you're putting 50% of your salary away, which we know realistically is not going to happen because most of us can't afford to save that much. That's true. I mean, in South Africa, we're sitting on a ticking time bomb. 66% of young people are unemployed. If they enter the job market at a very late stage, what is the outlook there? Maybe? Sure. And that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, in terms of that, with people, I talked about 25 as the age, and we've got a lot, a lot, of, a lot of youth that are only starting to work in their early 30s. Right. And then you're reducing your savings time down right. to 30 years, for example, which does put higher impact, <coughs> especially when that same youth are going to have longer life expectancies. We are getting healthier medical advances, you know, just generally we're all living a lot longer. So it is putting pressure, which demonstrates that there's even more importance on the fact that you need to be saving for most of your working life when you are working. When you're earning a salary, you should be saving towards retirement to ensure that when you don't, can't work anymore, you're not dependent right. on, on your family and your friends or the old age state pension, right. um, but you're actually dependent on yourself because you've managed to, to save. Right. And I think you raised a point around the fact that um, South Africans, the youth, are, are not working. But one of the biggest other challenges we have in South Africa with so much unemployment and with so many people who haven't prepared for retirement, the dependency ratio is exceptionally yeah. high. So it puts pressure on working South Africans now where the average working South African is, can be supporting up to five or ten people on yeah. their salary. Yeah. And so saving for retirement seems like an additional pressure but right. almost puts you in a position to break that cycle, right. where when you reach retirement, if you do save enough, it means you're not going to be one of those people depending on your children or family members. Then we've got another challenge with uh, employ some employers who actually don't offer that benefit to their employees where there's no retirement plan uh, provisioning. What is the problem? So in South Africa, the, 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 the legislation states quite clearly that as an employer, you don't have to offer your staff uh, pension benefits, but if you do, it has to be offered to everybody. So most of your large employers will have retirement funds, but a lot, a lot of your small and medium companies have got other um, folk things that they need to focus on. There's financial challenges as employers, and so it's not unusual that an employer doesn't offer. But then the onus is actually not on the employer to do that. It's you as an individual. It's that. It's that focus that when I start working, I actually need to start doing these boring adult things like <laughs> insurance and saving for retirement. Yeah. And I think part of that is if you work for an employer that does have benefits and, and savings, fantastic. That gives you a vehicle in which to use. It's still your responsibility to make sure you're putting away enough um, and that that fund does have the benefits you need. If not, you might still need to top it up. But if you're an individual where an employer doesn't give it to you, then you need to find your own vehicle. But there are retirement annuities and other ways of savings that you can, as an individual, still save for your retirement. So it shouldn't stop you saving for retirement. So if I were a shop steward of a trade union and I say to you, well, I hear you you're saying it, should, it is my responsibility, but what happens when my employer gives me little? Mm. Mm. And that, that, is, that is one of the biggest challenges because salaries are low and there's only so much that you can cut, you can mm. get out of it, you know. Um, but the other challenge is if you think it's little now, wait till retirement when you have no income. And mm. I think that's the problem because mm. it, it, we, we don't have a great safety net in South Africa mm. when it comes to retirement savings. So if you don't save at all and you don't do anything, when you reach retirement, the only thing that's there for you is 1,900 Rand, mm. which is the old age state pension. And that's it. So if you were, if you were earning, say, seven or 8,000 Rand a month when you were working, 
the likelihood of you coming out on 1900 Rand, it's, it's not going to happen. It doesn't yeah. matter how you try and balance the books. Mm. And so as uncomfortable it is, even if you can put 5 or 10% of your salary away into a retirement fund, it will make a big difference in supplementing that 1900 So you know that that's your base, mm. but at least you want to get slightly <clears throat> more than that, which is where that conversation But goes. aren't there countries in the world that make uh, co uh, you know, retirement benefit compulsory that every employer must provide? There is, and it seems to be the most effective because mandating retirement fund coverage means you're forced to, and it's that sort of thing that a lot of us don't like to do it, mm. but if we're told to and we do it, we do it, and mm. then it actually is for our good, right? Mm. Um, so yes, around the world there's a number of countries that have compulsory retirement fund savings where they say you must put a certain amount. There's a lot of funds where it makes it compulsory to contribute to a government's fund of some sort, which means that actually you know that, that, that is, um, it gives you that security to know you're going to be okay. We are not there yet in mm. South Africa. So we know statistically there's only about 50% of working South Africans are actually on a retirement fund, mm. which is a low proportion. Um, and most of the people not on a fund are those in the medium and smallest employers. Um, and the self-employed, and of course your, your, your um, informal workers, um, people who don't earn a regular income. Often it's very difficult for people to access or find the right place or know how to do that savings. Mm. Um, so a part of the conversations that have been happening in the industry over the last year, two years, three years, has been this whole concept of does government make it compulsory? Do they make it, the wording is around auto-enrollment mm. or mandatory provision, mm. where they're looking at saying how can we make it compulsory for, um, for people to be members of retirement funds and make it compulsory for employers to provide. So I think that's in the, on the cards, mm. but I think it's a long term away because there's a lot of things that, you know, we can't put too much more pressure. Mm. We know small businesses are taking strain. We know medium sized businesses are taking strain. To put more pressure on the fact that on financially they need to now put these uh, products together, retirement on top, mm. it, it adds quite a bit more. And then also it impacts that whole minimum wage discussion, which yeah. is a whole conversation on ah. its own and how it influences. Yeah. So I think we, we're on that journey in mm. South Africa, I mean that there's been a whole lot of new noise around retirement reform, and which is which is really exciting. Mm. Um, but it's not, not this stuff doesn't get fixed overnight. It's yeah. gonna it's a journey we're on that we're gonna need to follow the right steps. There is this figure of six percent that's been talked about for many years that only six percent of South Africans can actually retire comfortably, meaning ninety four percent of our population of not just the overall population, but the population of those who have a retirement benefit can actually uh, retire comfortably. I mean, 94%? It's a scary statistic. It, it is absolutely terrifying. And often I look at it and I think as someone who works in this space, we failed, right? Because if only 6% of the people who are using your products are, are retiring comfortably, then you haven't achieved at all what you should be achieving. Um, but the honest truth is a lot of those reasons are structural reasons. Mm. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. So, so we don't have a minimum contribution rate in this country if you retire, contribute mm. to retirement savings. And so the magic number around the world for retirement savings is the 15%. So there's no exact numbers, but mm. I'm just using an approximate number. So mm. you should be saving about 15% of your salary every month should be going to, to some sort of retirement savings. Mm. But that is for your whole working career. Okay? Now, what we find is a lot of people are contributing something, but it's nowhere near that number. So mm. they think they're okay because they're in a retirement fund, they're saving, they're ticking the box, but they're only putting 5% or 10% of their salary mm. away. So that's the first reason that we find that there's a lack of con uh, 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 people not saving enough, is they're actually not putting enough into the system. Mm. And it's often a tick box approach. You know, I'm a member of a retirement fund, so I'm okay. Yeah. That must mean I'm okay. And that's a myth. And, and no one assesses, mm. but it, am I okay? How much do I need? And how much you might need at retirement and how much I might need at retirement might be two very different numbers based on our personal circumstances. So all of those factors should be taken into account. Another reason, and one of the very big reasons why people don't say, don't come out right, is this whole concept of preservation. Mm. Now, we have got a very unique legislation in South Africa around preservation. And what that states is if you change jobs, you can cash out your pension fund, right? Because mm. um, usually around the world, if you put money in for pension, you don't touch that money till you reach retirement age, till you're ready to use it. Mm. 
But here, that doesn't happen at all. So you're allowed to, you should preserve, right. but actually what people do when they change jobs is everyone gets all excited and right. thinks, ah, oh, I'm coming into some great money, right. my pension's going to be paid out, I will use it to buy X, spend on Y, et cetera, et cetera. And actually what then happens is we were discussing earlier about that 40 years of working or 30 years. Now, if I change jobs and every time I change jobs, I cash out, right then essentially I'm dropping that period of time for which I can save to right. being less and less and less. Right. And what we find happens realistically is when people get to the age of like 45, then people are, oh, oh wait, maybe I should look at retirement. And, and then they'll start saving. So we find people are only saving properly after they've cashed out, changed jobs, cashed out for those last like 10, 15, maybe 20 years of work. Mm. Now you can't save for 15 and 20 years and expect that money to last you for 20 or 30 years when you've retired. The math doesn't work it out, it's not gonna be there. And so that is one of the big challenges we have is around that whole concept. We find that as much as 90% of people when they change jobs cash out their pension fund. Yeah. That is a terrible That's statistic. That's a huge number. It's, yeah. it's a massive number. And so we really need to be looking structurally at changing that. So I, I thank you for demystifying the myth that just because I'm contributing towards a retirement fund, therefore I'm okay. So which brings uh, me to the next question. What is a retirement replacement ratio? What do we mean by that? Sure, okay. So let's, a, a retirement replacement ratio looks at how much am I earning after retirement in relation to how much I was earning before I was retiring. So let's say, for example, when I reached my retirement date, I was earning 10,000 Rand a month. If I had enough when I, after I'd retired, so the month after I've retired with all my pension savings to buy me a pension of 7,500 Rand, that means that's 75%. Because I was earning 10,000, I now can earn 7.5, that's a 75% replacement ratio. Right. So the concept of replacement ratio says how much do I need to save for so that when I reach retirement, I can replace that proportion of my income. And it's a very good concept because some people believe they should they have 100% or 50%, and that's very individual. And I'll give you an example. So if I've, by the time I've reached retirement, my house is paid off, my kids have moved out of home, et cetera, et cetera, I might need a lot less to live on mm. than say somebody who was renting, who still got dependents at home, they might've been earning 10, spending the full 10, and they're gonna need a full 10 when they retire as well. So that replacement ratio will vary, and it's a very individual number. And so that's part of the whole retirement planning conversation. Um, like we speak about the fact if you're part of a retirement fund, that's great, box ticked. But right. you actually need to sit down with someone and say, how much do I need at retirement? Um, how much should I be putting away to get that based on what I'm planning? Right. And I mean, the numbers, are, it's, 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 it's a long-term journey. So, so it's not something you need to do every day. If you check the right numbers are going in, then they stay in. But yeah, the idea is the replacement ratio gives you something to target at retirement, so you know how much money. And the average that everybody uses is 75%. So, so that the logic says that you shouldn't need all your salary, so let's use a benchmark of 75%. So depending on how you are to that 75% determines how close you are to the average person being able to retire okay. So if I understand you correctly, in simple terms you're saying, if I earn 10,000 rand a month, the day I retire, whatever contribution I was making towards a retirement fund should actually buy me back a retirement annuity equivalent to 75% of my last paycheck in order to maintain the same standard of living once I retire. That's 100% right. Yeah. But then you have a situation where there are people who retire and they're still paying a bond. Correct. So what happens then? So then you might need a higher replacement ratio. So when we get to retirement, and this is always the big thing as well, we talk about this retirement date and this retirement age, and it's probably the time where you are making the biggest financial decisions of your life, right? Yeah. I mean, if you saved okay, and these are very rough back of the cigarette box type calculations, but if you've saved for your whole working lifetime, you've made sure you've saved enough, you've probably saved between 10 and 12 times your annual salary. Uh -huh. okay. Please say that again. You've probably, if in order, when you reach retirement date, so if I'm retiring at 65, the amount that should be in my retirement fund should be equivalent to 10 to 12 times my annual salary. Mm. Okay. So that is a large amount of money. 
And the idea is, when you reach retirement, you now need to manage that properly <laughs> to make sure it lasts you over the rest of your life. So mm. you mentioned purchasing an annuity. Mm. So what happens is actually I need to sit at retirement with my financial advisor and say, right, I've got 10 times my annual salary. I need to now buy a monthly income. Because if I, if somebody gave me, hmm. and this is realistic, but if someone gave me 10 times my annual salary when hmm. I turned 65 and said, here, Michelle, <laughs> make it last till you die, I'm going to get that wrong. Hmm. And I'm going to get it wrong for a couple of reasons. Firstly, if there's money in my account, I'm very likely to spend it. I can try what I like, but something that should last 20 or 30 years will last five and it'll be gone. So the one aspect is to give a lump sum and expect it to last. As, but the other aspect is, you, it becomes very difficult to budget. So you don't, you, you, so, so the idea is you take that money, let's say, let's say it's a million rand, for mm. example. Now take that million rand and I want to go buy a pension. Um, and so you go to all the different insurers and find who can give you the best price and you buy a pension that locks you in with an income for the rest of your life, mm. box ticked. But what you also can do at retirement at that point is that Doug, you do have the option to take up to a third of it in cash, mm. right? So if I have that million, I can take say 300,000 and that gives me the opportunity at retirement to settle my bond. Mm. So if you have that ability, you then can do that to say, actually I'll settle my bond and then I'll buy an income and then that should give me an opportunity to, um, to secure my income and then at least I'm, I'm financially, as financially secure as one can be. Um, yeah, so, so often when you've, you've got a bond still at retirement, that is definitely one of your options. The other is you've just got to save a lot more because you'll need a higher replacement ratio. That's true. That's true. I mean, especially because when you retire, you, you will need a medical aid. Uh, you will need other things. I mean, in order to maintain the same standard of living, I mean, the quality of um, or access to quality health care, very, very critical when you retire. And unfortunately, if you don't have a proper income, it means your standard of living will drop, and then actually you're tiring into poverty. Which brings me to the next question, because um, government is certainly concerned about people who resign in order to access their pension, um, you know, to settle their debt, or to do any other thing, uh, you know, with their pension money. Why is that a problem? Um, you know, because I know some people have concerns about. No, why, why do you want to make changes? I mean, because it's my money. What are your views? So I think it comes back to that point I made earlier about that whole dependency ratio. So we're currently at 6% um, amounts of you know, people who can actually retire. And, and to be honest, that number's not great because it means the proportion of people in South Africa, depending on an old age state grant, is mm. massive. Mm. It's not sustainable. Yeah. And also, the dependency ratio on the working population is getting higher and higher. So what, tre what National Treasury and government are trying to achieve is they're saying, right, if people are saving for retirement, which we know, as I said, most people, 50% of the population is saving, then it's absolutely critical that we, we make sure that that money is ring-fenced to retirement to give people the best chance they have at mm. financial security after retirement. Mm. And so they've looked at this and said, at the moment, people change jobs, as you mentioned. They're cashing out their pension. And often, you change jobs for a better job, right? You get a new job. It's a more salary. It's not even the reason you, you don't want to change jobs to access your pension. You know, you're going into high income. But you still cash out your pension because you see that you've got the opportunity to. So what government wants to look at is restricting that. Because accessing your pension should not be linked to changing jobs. Sure. It should be linked to other aspects of your life, but not changing jobs. So what are those changes that are being proposed uh, by government? I mean, I hear uh, people are excited. I mean, we're hearing that uh, very soon people will be able to access their pension earlier. Yes. So, so I think that, I mean, this is the whole framing. Uh, National Treasury has titled it the new two-pot system. Mm. And the idea of the two-pot system is twofold. The first part of two part is to, be a, is to actually stop people accessing their pension when they change jobs. Mm. So the idea is there's now going to be moving into a world of compulsory preservation. But the second element, and I'll take a step back, if there's one thing COVID showed us, <laughs> mm. is that the average South African has not got sufficient emergency savings mm. because there were a lot of people who got put very quickly into financial turmoil. and and they didn't have any sort of savings to fall back on. 
The second thing that came out of COVID was the fact that there were people, small business owners, working, uh, self-employed individuals, even people who were working for large companies, where because the financial pressure of COVID, salaries were cut, businesses, there was no business to be done, people might have had assets sitting in their retirement fund or in their retirement annuity fund, but they were unable to access them. Mm. And so there was a big plea to say, I've got money in my fund, please help me access it. So what Treasury is saying is actually we need to change our system, right? We need to change our regime because at the moment, the way we've currently got the system, it's not really, it's not meeting people's needs because it's not getting us to retirement. Um, and, and actually we need to enhance it. So it's, it's around the two parts. And the one part is around saying a portion of your contribution will be going into what they're calling a savings part. So a third of whatever you put away to retirement will go into the savings part. And the other two thirds will go into what they call a retirement pot. Mm. So you will have in your fund two pots. So mm. it's in your retirement fund, in your retirement annuity, two pots, a savings pot and a retirement pot. Now that retirement pot will then stay there till you reach retirement. So if you change jobs, you take you it with you. It. You can't access it. You take it to your new fund. You can put it in a preservation fund, etc. But it will need to stay there. That savings pot is now designed to be your emergency savings fund. So that money will continue to grow, and if you have an emergency, you can then access that money, um, where before you would have to change jobs to access. Oh. So there's no more link to changing jobs. You'll just run with these two pots. Your money will go in. If you never touch that savings pot, so if you never have an emergency and you manage to build it, when you get to retirement, that becomes your cash lump sum at retirement. But if, you, if life happens and there is an emergency before then, then you have the ability to access their savings pot. So it's going to be very different to how we do things now. Um, but I think in the long term, it will make a massive difference because it means every one of those members who's now a member of a retirement fund will have an emergency savings pot as well as a retirement pot in their same vehicle. So in other words, you're saying, you know, now the retirement fund is going to be structured in such a way that You've got two pots. The first pot is a savings pot, which can be accessed in the, in the event of emergencies. The second one, you say, is a retirement pot, which cannot be accessed if you change jobs. Um, what about a person who gets retrenched? Can they access the retirement uh, pot? No. So that retirement pot is exactly for that. It's retirement. That mm. is what your savings pot is. Mm. So the idea is if you got retrenched, that is an emergency savings pot use. Then you, could, you draw out of your emergency savings pot. So the, the legislation that we're seeing it now is not defining what an emergency is. That's for the likes of you and me to decide. That's our money. We've put it in the fund. If we need it, if we define an emergency as, uh, you know, depending on our own personal circumstances, but if you leave that money there over right. time, then if you were retrenched, then you will be, a, after you've used the UIF, because remember in South Africa, retrenchment, you have the unemployment insurance fund available right. for you as well. But it is definitely, um, it, that's one of the reasons that you could use it um, from that point of view. So in other words, this retirement pot, if I get retrenched and I still have another 10 years before I retire and I'm unemployed, I will have money, but I can't access that money. Correct. Because Correct. it's part of the retirement pot. So Correct. I just have to, according to that law, it means you just have to find a way to survive until you reach. You reach. Is, it, is it accessible on early retirement, which is 55, or should you wait for no, the full, so, so the it'll be retirement. accessible from early retirement, right? Mm. When SARS starts allowing you to access it. So that's so 55 years. That'll be 55. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So in that situation, you can start, you can, and remember when it comes to accessibility, you'll use that money to buy yourself a pension, mm. right? Um, so it'll buy yourself an, an income later. Um, so yes, there will be possible situations where you're retrenched, you've gone through UIF, you've spent your savings, um, but you will not be able to access this retirement part. Um, until you reach retirement age of 55 onwards. Um, and I think part of the logic is I know that's going to create a massive change management and people to understand the difference. But what we have already as it is, uh. is people, if they are retrenched, they get their fund out, they spend it, uh. and then they're still stuck. So, so at least this way, you know that there is some money that when you do reach retirement, uh. you're still going to have something um, to live on um, to provide financial support. All right, so in other words, this early access to pension actually talks to the, the savings part, which potentially you can access 
uh, for emergency, whichever way we define emergency. Because, I mean, I can have an emergency to buy a car. <laughs> you could. You could. <laughs> Not sure how many cars over the while. Yeah. So, so, yes, I think that's been, uh, there's been a lot of media focus on this whole access, being able to access your retirement fund over the last couple of years. Mm. Um, especially in the last, since middle of last year, I think, onwards. Um, and the idea is actually, this is not touching existing money. Yes. So, so one of the important things to remember is if I've got 100,000 Rand in my retirement fund, when the changes come into play, mm. then that money is, is still, all the old rules are still applicable to it. So mm. if I resign, I can cash it out, etc. So you've still got that. This is only referring to future money. Okay. So contributions going forward. Mm. So there's this massive assumption that I'm going to be able to access a third of my existing money when this comes into play. No, mm. that's, not a, that's not the case. Um, the only thing you'll be able to access if you change jobs, you'll still be able to access what I'm going to call your old money, yes, if I can put money. it that, or what yes. the legislation refers to as a vested pot. Yes. You know, that money belongs to you, the rules don't change, etc. It's just going forward. So, if we look realistically, it's going to take a while to build it up. So, if I use a very simple example, if my contribution to my retirement fund is 600 rand a month, okay, that means I'll have 200 rand a month going into my savings pot, mm -hmm. and I'll have 400 rand a month going into my retirement pot, right? Mm. It is going to take a while for that savings pot to build up that you can buy a car. Mm. But, you know, it will build up. And the idea is if you leave it an, an emergency event, usually shouldn't happen more than once every five years. I mean, mm. it happened to all of us when we went through COVID. Mm. But if you properly manage your money and you properly plan, then actually you should have a rainy day fund elsewhere, not just mm. sitting in the pension. Mm. Um, but yeah, it will take a while because it's only going to get started. So it's not day one you get all this money access. No, it's looking at going forward money wow. that you save. That, that's very significant because a, the, a lot of people are excited. Oh, I'm going to be able to access my pension money. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying this piece of legislation, which is still being cooked, if I may use that term, when it gets effective, only then can you access the savings pot. But the reality is that you spoke about old money, you, talk about, you spoke about future money. So at the point at which this law becomes effective in the future, you still need to build a savings pot because right now there will be zero in that pot. Is that correct? That's 100% correct, yeah. So, so this excitement that, well, I'm going to be able to access my pension early while I'm still working, it, it's actually going to take a while for you to build up enough savings for you to be able to access. Let's say, hypothetically, this law comes into effect on, in the, on the 1st of March 2023, as an example. Then first month is end of March, then that's the first time I'm now starting to build that savings pot going, you know, over the next 12 months. So effectively, it means people can, if it became law in March next year, or 2023, it means I can only access it uh, in 2024 or thereabout, but again, depending on how much I've saved, is that correct? That's correct. So one of the two elements that they're putting is, is restrictions, if I can use that one, the savings part, is you must have at least 2,000 Rand in the account to Minimum. Withdraw. Minimum. Mm. Okay? Because it stops you going to draw 100 Rand, 100 Rand, 100 Rand. Because it's not designed to be that. This, yeah. is a, this is a pension vehicle. It's a highly regulated, highly protected pension vehicle. So, so it's not like your bank account. Um, so from that aspect, it'll take a while um, to, to build it up. And once you've got to the 2,000, you can access. The second restriction is you can only access it once a year. Hmm. So once a year you can go and, and access. And I think there's going to be a lot more work going around. How am I going to access it? What forms do I need to complete? That's far down the line in terms of what your pension fund and the rules around that. But it's important to note, like you said, don't get excited around I'm going to access immediately, etc. A pension fund is a long-term savings yes. vehicle. There is no quick fix to I'm in trouble now, I need to access money now. That's, that, that's what, not what the system is designed. It's designed that over the next 10, 20, 30 years, if we can bring these changes into place, it will mean that people starting work now, when they reach retirement, will probably be in a much better place financially than people who are retiring now mm. because of the new regime that is being put into place. 
I, I, I saw a couple of media reports, people speculating and saying this new law the, of the two-part system when it comes to uh, pension will become effective in March 2023. Is that true? I think it's exceptionally optimistic. So, so let's just have a think about what the process is here. So we are changing a whole pension fund system in a country. So firstly, there's a huge amount of legislation change that needs to come, right? Mm -hmm. The Income Tax Act needs to change, the Pension Fund Act needs to change, all of those aspects, and that's not something that gets done quickly. Mm. So realistically, even if everybody was full on agreement and this was ready to roll, I don't think the legislation would be ready until mm. probably early to mid next year. Mm. So that's just the regulations. Mm. Then all your pension fund providers, your retirement funds, then have to get ready for this new law which means system changes, rule changes, you know, all of those elements, plus SARS themselves needs to get up to date to make sure that their tax systems and, the, and their, their administration systems can manage these new changes. Yeah. So there's quite a bit that needs to happen to make this, this happen properly. Yeah. Um, so I can't imagine that, that 2023 is realistic yeah. because I, I think that it's going to take at least, even from when we're ready with the regulations, I think it'll be at least 12 months to get systems up and going. So I think we're looking at a 2024, 2025 implementation of these changes. So in the last budget speech uh, in February 2022, looking at the 2022 financial year, there were some announcements made by Treasury on pension funds, effective first of all. What were those changes? What has changed right now? So I think there was those changes that happened last year, mm. right? So mm. last year we had that whole newitization change. Mm. And that whole convert the, the pension provident fund change. I don't know if you remember. Please explain that. So, so I remember earlier I mentioned the fact that if you have, uh, let's say you've had a million rand saved at retirement, people, especially members of provident funds, would be able to take that whole one million rand in cash, mm. Mm. and off they go. Now we know that also that's one of the reasons people don't have enough at retirement because mm. they take this, they start a business, the business doesn't work. Or, or they, they spend it really quickly, and so they run out of money quite quickly. And so the law changed last year to say, actually, um, when you reach retirement, you must actually buy a pension. You can't take it all in cash. You can take a third in cash, but the rest you must use to buy an income. Because otherwise, your water and lights bill, your, your rent, your food, you can't buy it once off when you retire and hope it's going to last you forever. Um, so it actually you do need to break your, your lump sum savings into monthly incomes so that it can align with what your actual expenditure is. And so that law changed last year for anyone under 55. So the over 55s, they can still get all of their money out in cash, but the under 55s, it changed to say, actually moving forward, you must buy a pension with your money at, with, with at least two thirds of your money in retirement. So that change has happened. And it's one of many changes because I think it was Sure, going back in the history books, 2012, I think it was, where they released papers to say, actually, we need to resolve our, our retirement fund industry is not working. So there has been a lot of focus on costs and bringing costs down in funds. There's been a lot of focus on governance and getting the governance right. There's been a lot of focus on consolidation. And then the focus on annuitization, which was last year, and now they're focusing on preservation. So mm. this is a part of a much bigger plan to ultimately improve retirement outcomes for people in South Africa. So in other words, um, you know, we used to have what we call a pension fund and provident fund, and the rules uh, of pension funds and provident funds were a bit dif different because they were structured different. Maybe you want to touch on that uh, briefly, and what's the difference? And those changes that you are referring to, which happened uh, in 2021, mm -hmm. uh, but also subsequent announcement in 2022 and during the budget speech, um, so what changes there effectively? Okay, so the whole concept of a provident fund was I save for retirement, same as you do pension. I always believe the simplest way to think of a retirement fund is think of it as a savings account, right? Yeah. If you open a savings account in your bank, the only, you know, you put money in every month and that money might earn interest mm. and then when you finally want it, you access it. Now mm. the idea is it's just a very, very long-term savings account. So both provident funds and pension funds operate, at this, operate the same way. You put some money in, it goes in tax deductible, which means you haven't paid any tax on it, and it continuously takes, um, uh, you build it up over time. But that's the same for both pension and provident. The only difference between pension and provident fund was that if you were in a provident fund and you, you reached retirement, you could take all of your money out in cash, mm. but in a pension fund, 
you, had to, you could only take a third in cash and two thirds you'd need to annuitize. Now there were previously other differences, but those over time have been moved out, and so that's been sort of the only difference over the last couple of years. So this change said actually for money going in after a certain date, which was the 1st of March 2021, yeah. that money must be also used to be a pension fund. So now, realistically going forward, we only have pension funds. Yeah. Right? So if you've got provident fund money, your provident fund money is protected. Yeah. But actually part of the process was you will need to buy a pension when you reach retirement. So that, that is part of the change now. So it's aligning pension and providence. So in the big picture going forward, there is very little difference between a pension and a provident fund now. Okay. So in, in conclusion, if you were to speak to employers about preparations they need to make, uh, in anticipation of these new laws, what would that be? And secondly, what would your message be to any worker, um, whether self-employed or employed, um, what do you say people should do in order to prepare properly for retirement? Sure. So the first question you asked me about what would I tell employers, I think the important thing there is to get a message to people not to panic these changes will take a while to come into play and because of the whole vested rights and protected no one's losing anything there's no money going i mean i remember i think it was 2016 when changes were coming through and there was a whole lot of concerns mm. around the fact that sure these changes are going to come in and government's going to take my money i must cash out now i must resign now and take my money etc there's absolutely no need to panic there will be quite a couple of changes, but most of the changes is not really going to implement, impact the employer. It's actually the funds. So the retirement funds will need to do all the work mm -hmm. <laughs> around making sure these changes, but there will be a lot of member communication coming out, et cetera. So from that aspect, I think there's still, we're still a long way from having it finalized. Look, when I say a long way, I'm talking 18 months or whatever. So, mm -hmm. so just make sure you're comfortable and you understand what this means. That's always the best thing is get the facts. Don't lean on the rumors. For an individual, I think one of the important things to remember is some, your, your retirement fund is your responsibility. Okay? No one's going to do it for you. Even if you're part of an employer fund and you're ticking the box, it's still up to you to take responsibility for it. And everybody needs one. So unless you're one of the very, very few lucky people that win the lotto <laughs> or, or have inheritances that, that you can live on for the rest of your life, most of us are going to get to an age where we're going to need to live on our savings. Mm -hmm. And so that becomes each of our own responsibilities. Don't be afraid to ask for help. But really, it's something that it's never too early to get started with. Yeah, interesting. Well, there's a show called I Blew It. Uh, hopefully, one day we'll come up with a concept that says I grew it. That's it. I love it. Michelle, thank you so much. I think we've learned a lot. And uh, until next time. Thanks, John. It's been great. Thank you.